David Stewart. David is Associate Professor of Romantic Literature at the University of Northumbria at Newcastle upon Tyne. And we're delighted to welcome David back to the Charles Lamb Society. David is the author of two important, groundbreaking, beautifully written monographs, Romantic Magazines and Metropolitan Literary Culture, 2011, and The Form of Poetry in the 1820s and 1830s, A Period of Doubt, published in 2018. David's title today is There Goes Tom and Jerry, on a spree with Pierce Egan's life in London. David, the floor is yours. Thank you very much indeed, John, and, and thank you to you and, and Felicity, and indeed the whole Charles Lamb Society for, for hosting me. Um, it's great to be back in the Lamb Society, the, the best literary society. Um, okay, so I will share my PowerPoint now. And Okay. <coughs> okay, today's paper is about Pierce Egan, is the, sorry, is the PowerPoint still there? No, no, it's gone AWOL. It's gone, sorry, I'll try again. Okay. Okay. Uh, it's back, David. Okay. Today's paper is about Pierce Egan's life in London or the day and night scenes of Jerry Hawthorne Esquire and his elegant friend Corinthian Tom, accompanied by Bob Logic, the Oxonian, in their rambles and sprees through the metropolis. It's a book first serialized towards the end of August 1820 and published in book form 200 years ago in 1821. I'm currently working on an edition of Life in London for Oxford World's Classics with Simon Koveshi, John Gardner and Matt Sangster. Though we're publishing this as a world's classic, that classic status remains an aspiration the edition seeks to achieve. It remains a rare book and one that is difficult to read without notes. Life in London offers special challenges to a reader and an editor. It will become clear during my talk, I think, why we needed a team of us to edit the book. And I want to gratefully acknowledge the work of my co-editors. Anything good in today's paper belongs to Matt, Simon and John, but I take full responsibility for all the errors of judgment and fact. Editing a book makes you read it differently. Life in London is itself, I propose, concerned with reading, something pro prompted by its subject matter, Regency London and its print culture. The relationship between reading and metropolitan crowds of readers is also a concern, of course, of Charles Lamb's. In a moment, I'll introduce Life in London properly. Egan's book is, I know, familiar to some today who are here today, and it's intriguing that many of Egan's best critics, Greg Darts, John Strachan, Richard Cronin, John Gardner, Rob Morrison, to name only a few, have also been critics of Lamb. Simon Kaveshi is another of them, and he discusses very insightfully the egan Elia connection in a 2006 article in the Charles Lamb Bulletin. Thomas Hood tells an anecdote of the London magazine days, the time of Char uh, John Clare's second visit to London in 1822. Lamb and Clare hit it off, and in wending homewards through the Strand, the peasant and Elia, Sylvanus et Orban, linked comfortably together, there arose the frequent cry of, look at Tom and Jerry, there goes Tom and Jerry. For truly, Clare in his square cut green coat and Lamb in his black were not a little suggestive of Hawthorne and logic in the plates to life in London. Well, there are reasons to question Hood's reminiscence, not least that his article of 1839 is posed in a self-consciously ironical manner. Lamb and Clare are called Tom and Jerry, that is, Corinthian Tom and his country cousin, Jerry Hawthorne. Lamb is an unlikely Tom. Urban, certainly, but nothing like Tom's tall, upright, casually self-confident figure that we see on the right slide here. 
Hood recognizes that by making Lamb not Corinthian Tom, but Bob Logic, the, the bespectac bespectacled, shorter, soi disant Oxonian on the left. Lamb, of course, only visited Oxford on the vacation, but there are similarities here. Bob is a punster, a learned man, and one who often timed his Saturnalia amiss, to use Lamb's phrase, drinking too much for an increasingly genteel age. But it feels like a slip on Hood's part. Would the crowds really have called Lamb Tom? What gives the anecdote an air of plausibility is that when, Lamb, when Claire visited London, in 1822, Egan really would have been on the tongues of working class Londoners. By 1822, there was a life in London mania that embraced the very lowest price points in the print market, included cheap illustrations and a vast number of theatrical productions. First though, let me explain what life in Lo London is, starting with its author, Pierce Egan. Egan's origins are in Charleville, the market town in the rich farming country in North C County Cork, Ireland, where his grandfather was a Church of Ireland minister. Egan's uncle took one branch of the family onto wealth and respectab respectability eventually in Hungary. Egan's father sank down the social scale so badly that he ended up leaving Cork for Dublin. Pierce Egan was born probably in Dublin in late 1774 and the family very shortly moved to London. Pierce was apprenticed to a printer at Bloomsbury, and it's a trade that he never really left. Egan knew all the branches of the printing trade and all its levels. He edited, that is, embellished, reworked and reprinted texts for the cheap book trade. He worked as a compositor. Richard Cronin calls Egan the most typographically inventive author of the period, a period notable, as Cronin shows, for its typographical flair. Egan's writing is fascinated with the mechanics of work, especially the mechanics of authorship. I include on this slide a selection of his publications. Egan was a jobbing writer, a gentleman of the press. A great number of his publications, including his two newspapers, use his name in the title. He was a name, a celebrity of a kind. And yet his was a precarious career. Egan is best known as a boxing journalist, as discussed by John Strachan, John Whale, and most fully in David Snowden's excellent book, Writing the Prize Fight. The mixed social world of boxing was Egan's true love. He was a proud member of the Daffy Club, a drinking club, Daffy is gin, that celebrated boxing and was located at the Castle Tavern in Holborn, pub owned by the, the boxer Tom Belcher. The slang and intensely masculine homosociality of boxing and drinking was where Egan was happiest. His other great love was the theatre, as I'll say later, a huge percentage of the reference points in life in London are theatrical. Egan's greatest splash was Life in London. The book was serialised from the 31st of August, 1820, selling at two and six. Half a crown is not cheap, but neither is it hugely expensive. It's the same price, interestingly, as an issue of a popular magazine like Blackwood's Magazine or the London Magazine. The book consists of a series of adventures or sprees taken by Tom as he, as he shows his cousin Jerry around London in the company of Bob Logic. Those scenes are pointedly, indeed staggeringly diverse. They take in drinking Blue Ruin with beggars, a trip to the theater and a visit to the green room, horse riding in Rotten Row, the Fleet Prison, Almack's Ballroom, Carton Palace, the Royal Exchange and Newgate Prison. A summary is irresistible, but impossible. The sheer variety of the book, and this is one of my main points, that sheer variety prompts problems in how we read it. The trio tour around London, though as we can see from Matt Sangster's splendid map, their geographical limit is relatively circumscribed. The magazines of this era are interested in suburban areas. Lee Hunt writes of walks around Hampstead, the new monthly magazine, described the, the then developing area, Bloomsbury. But this is not Egan's interest. 
What he does is he takes readers where they may never have gone, whether that is waltzing with the angelics at my Lady Fubb's assembly at Almax, or sporting a toe at Mrs. Snook's hop at St. Kitts, among the pretty straw damsels and dashing chippers. It's a colourful tale, made more so by the images. Egan worked with Bob and George Cruikshank, who provided woodcuts and 36 colour plates. The text was so popular that, according to Egan's Victorian editor, John Camden Houghton, armies of women and children were employed to colour the plates, meaning that the surviving editions are not uniform. The relationship between text and image is unusually important in life in London. It's sometimes said that the plates came first and that Egan simply annotated them. That's not right. The text came first and the book is quite properly described as Pierce Egan's life in London. And yet to describe these as illustrations is to miss their importance. Often Egan's text really is a gloss to the images, pointing out features that the reader may have missed. The two work together to create the kaleidoscopic blur that is the novel. In life in London, the printed text is itself constantly an image. Egan's use of italics and small capitals became famous. These images on, on this slide give some indication of the variety of the visual spectacle of a page of life in London. It's a variety that our edition will attempt to preserve. The idea of a book detailing the pleasures and dangers of London life was not original. On the contrary, there were dozens of such books, often offering contrasts between the poor and the elite, and frequently dwelling on the seedier side of London life, especially its prostitution. The most famous example of this is from the late 17th century, Ned Ward's London Spy, although there are many, many others. It may not have been an original idea, but none became a phenomenon quite like Egan's Life in London. The book sold extremely well, with multiple editions throughout the 1820s carrying on across the, across the 19th century. J.C. Reed is the great hero to all Egan scholars for the extent and accuracy of his research. Reed describes a Tom and Jerry mania, which extended to snuff boxes, painted fire screens, shawls, handkerchief, fans, cushions, and dress stuffs marked with the images of the two heroes and Corinthian styles from tailors, bootmakers, and hatters. I've got images of two snuff boxes on the slide here. Tom and Jerry at one point knock over a Charlie, which is a, a watchman in his box. And Egan was blamed for starting a fashion for repeating the trick. And later in life, he brazenly wrote to Sir Robert Peel asking for a pension. He claimed that by doing so, by depicting these um, Charlies being knocked over, he'd hastened the reform of the Charlies leading to the Bobbies, the new police. Any phenomenon encourages people to cash in, and they certainly did with life in London. This is just a selection of the many, many rip-offs of the novel that appeared. It was a readily transportable phenomenon, and the sheer number is striking. Some are simply attempts to replicate the story, occasionally shifting the location, Dublin or Paris. Some bring the price point down, Jem Catnatch's rip-offs are two pence and are mainly comprised of songs with woodcuts and a brief summary of the story. These are truly popular productions aimed squarely at a labouring class audience and using techniques not so much different from the broadside ballad tradition. The theatrical productions on the right of the slides were the true money spinner. Egan did eventually do very well at the theatre Though the vast, the vast majority of these Tom and Jerry plays, and this is simply a snapshot, did not make him a penny. David Worrell is the best guide to this culture, and I could do little more than recommend his The Politics of Re Romantic Theatricality. He tracks the Tom and Jerry phenomenon um, around Britain and Ireland and also across the Atlantic to a company of black actors on Mercer Street off Broadway who adapted Tom and Jerry with scenes set in a slave market. 
The afterlife of Tom and Jerry uh, in the popular culture of the 20s and 30s has also been discussed very well by Brian Maidment and Mary Shannon. It gives us some indication that Thomas Hood's anecdote, which I began, has some truth in it. Seeing two men walk by, one in a green coat, one in black, might well have brought out the cry, there goes Tom and Jerry. But it also indicates Egan's proximity to, and I think his distinction from, a truly mass audience. And it might also suggest the insecurity of the class position occupied by Egan and by the magazine writers, Hood, Claire, and Lamb. Being pointed out in the street, as Lamb reminds us in his Elia essays, is not always a comfortable experience. Pierce Egan sits at the centre of this buzz of activity. This book reflects that in its giddy succession of scenes. Almost every critic of Egan remar remarks upon the theatricality or the spectacularity that results from this rush of different scenes. There's a half-hearted attempt to give this story a in, in that Bob ends up in debtor's prison and Jerry is beaten to a standstill by all the carousing and must return to the country to recuperate. But the novel seems to forget Bob is still in the fleet is one indication that tying up the threads of the narrative was not Egan's interest. That metaphor of a text composed of threads that are woven together to create a pattern doesn't really work. Life in London is composed of bits, to use the word the characters use, as in a prime comic bit or seeing a bit of life. When it was pr pr printed as a single volume in 1821, you can change the order of the episodes slightly from the order they had appeared in as serialized numbers. It didn't make the least difference. Egan is a winningly immodest writer, always ready to quote his own work. So I hope you don't mind if I, Egan-like, do the same thing. I first worked on Egan as part of my book on literary magazines. A serialised monthly part of Life in London sold at the same price as the London magazine, half a crown, and an episode contained a similar variety. The slightly awkward phrase I used to describe the aesthetic of the magazines was the principle of miscellaneity. These publications created a style as diverse as its audience. An audience figured most clearly in a crowd at one of the entertainments visited by Tom and Jerry. These publications also encouraged a mode of reading that was, for many in the period, worrying. Egan called London a complete cyclopedia, but its readers were continually losing their place. Egan had no interest in reading the city as a continuous ordered whole. Egan's ideal Londoner, London observer is, I argued, a cockney of the kind best suited to the magazine market, one in between social and aesthetic categories and better able to appreciate the giddy whirl of scenes. Well, it sounds fun, but it can be troubling. Deborah Epstein Nord's influential account of the novel emphasizes a theatricality that keeps the characters aloof from what they observe, negating any understanding of social unrest or disturbance. John Gardner describes how Egan co-opted the cross-class audience of radical satirists like William Hone, but de-radicalized such literature by making it simply a spectacle. Simon Hull finds the same feature leads to an amoral indifference to poverty. Richard Cronin calls Egan a pathologically unfeeling writer, a point that is formal rather than censorious. It's exactly by passing so quickly from scene to scene that readers, as much as Tom and Jerry, are freed to become amused spectators of what they see, whether that's the Italian opera or a man condemned to death in Newgate. These critics worry at a common problem, how to make something of a text that seems to resist our efforts to do anything other than skip from scene to scene. Well, Egan gives a sentimental moment. The characters are upset to see a Cyprian, which is a higher class of prostitute, wrongly tried. They witness poverty. They shed a tear over the noble behavior of an aged duke who is kind to his much younger wife. 
Bob Logic does seem genuinely moved to see his one-time drinking pal reduced to being a condemned criminal at Newgate. But such moments last such a short time that it seems absurd to take them seriously as part of a coherent aesthetic or social vision. One might say similarly, similarly that Egan has his moments of political anger, a huge footnote about the iniquity of pawnbrokers or more problematically, Tom's supposed exposure of the beggars who claim to be disabled but are in fact, according to Tom, healthy and wealthy. One could find a counter example at every moment, a point of sentiment balanced by a point of callous indifference, wearisome misogyny balanced by a celebration of a woman who resists male oppression, a succession of sly references to the radical cause celebre of 1820 to 21, the Queen Caroline affair, balanced by scenes that indicate that the poor lead rich and fulfilling lives and the status quo seems just fine. It's hard not to feel angry at the indifference to suffering that structures the text. Simon Koveshi describes Tom and Jerry economically secure in their decadent fun, safe in the fat belly of the middle classes. This is also the feeling that Dickens seems to have had when he took the slight sneer the Cruikshanks gave to Corinthian Tom in the plate and created Sir Mulberry Hawk in Nicholas Nickleby. Going around knocking over watchmen might sound, if we're generous, like the behaviour of P.G. Woodhouse's Drones Club, if we're less generous, like the behaviour of the current Prime Minister when he was a member of the Bullingdon Club. The Bullingdon Club built on historical precedent, but it is the Mohawks they represent, they, they resemble most. The aristocratic rapist thugs of the late 17th and early 18th century. That's not Tom and Jerry. Dickens's Sir Mulberry Hawk is different not just because he's a villain, but because he has an interior life and a definable social position, some with a past whose actions have consequences. He's a character of a quite different kind to Corinthian Tom, and Dickens is as an attitude to the novel of a different kind. Simon Hull thoughtfully uses the word tentative to describe Charles Lamb's engagement with London life. There's a similar tentativeness in Egan, one result that results from the feeling that these constant transitions from scene to scene, this endless masquerade is so obviously a show or a fantasy. Egan in his dictionary defines a swell as a gentleman, but any well-dressed person is emphatically termed a swell or a rank swell. A gentleman, of course, is not the same thing as a well-dressed person. The first plate gives us Jerry in training for a swell. The idea seems simple enough, the country man learning city ways. But one might wonder whether all swells must be trained up. These are people trying on a pose. Gregory Dart describes Egan with most precision in pointing to his indeterminacy and vagueness that was, that was essential to his huge popular appeal. Some Buddha Sen's insightful work emphasizes a randomness that inheres in the relationship between the city's variety, superficial characters, and, Le and Egan's lack of interest in plot. Life in London made a cross-class appeal to readers, but it did so by virtue of not really belonging anywhere. It's a product of Cockneys, as defined by Greg Dart. That is, Cockneys who belong in that uncertain realm between polite and popular literature, a realm that included, of course, the literary magazines that were selling at the same price as a serialized number of Life in London. Like those magazines and like Charles Lamb, Egan produced work that mingles liberation and uncertainty in equal measure, a cocktail made possible by being in between cultural categories, half bound, as Lamb said, of magazines. Learning to see life in London is for Egan also about learning to read life in London. Just as he had done in his boxing journalism, Egan helps the reader become an insider by learning the languages of groups who speak a special dialect. 
In 1822, Egan published a radically updated version of Francis Gross's class classical dictionary of the vulgar tongue. He's building also on the 1811 revision lexicon Balatronicum. This was one of Egan's own attempts to cash in on the Tom and Jerry phenomenon, but it also builds on something that is essential to life in London. One of our jobs editing this book is a work of translation. Some of the pages are almost incomprehensible without notes, but Egan was himself concerned with translation. In one of his many long footnotes, he states that he wishes to make himself perfectly intelligible to all parties. Half the world is up to it. And it's my intention to make the other half down to it. Slang is not exclusive to one class, Egan says. He points out that dingy Sal of the lower orders might talk of her prime Jackie and an out and out concern, but a duchess in her dislikes tosses her head, observing it was shocking, quite a bore, beastly stuff. The pleasure for readers lies in the way that Egan leaves us half in and half out, glossing some words with footnotes, but leaving others, leaving gaps for us to fill in. Take this account of Tom's character. His peep into the stews, excuse me, here it is. His peep into the stews was merely en passant, and the knowing, enticing mother dish ups something new was tried on in vain to have the best of our hero for only a single darkie. Well, Egan's dictionary doesn't help because it defines darky as a dark lantern used by housebreakers. It's clear though, uh, from how Egan uses the word elsewhere, that darky simply means the night. Stews is easy enough to guess and even I can manage en passant. So we start to piece it together. Tom only rarely visited brothels and the cunning madam may have palmed off her latest prostitute on him, but only for a single night. Well, this is Egan at his most risque. The novel's actually far more cautious than we might expect, as is his dictionary. Reading the book can feel like stumbling about in the dark, as every fourth word placed in italics by Egan is slang of some kind. Some are easy enough to get. A fish fag is not in Egan's dictionary, but a fish fag is a foul-mouthed woman, as was notoriously the case of the fishwives at Billingsgate Market. Gills are cheeks. The knowledge box is the head. A caster is a beaver skin hat. Ogles are eyes. And a suit of mourning, a pair of black eyes. Egan takes his slang from dustmen, thieves, beggars, the navy, prostitutes, Oxford students, members of the fancy of boxing enthusiasts, and importantly, from actors. Some of these words are still used, such as pigs for police, or to floor, meaning to knock someone down. Some are still used in Regency romances that borrow from Georgette Hare, such as pink of the ton. There are an enormous number of words for gin, including Dee Dee's Fluid, Max, Blue Ruin, Old Tom, Tape, Jackie, Stark Naked, and Flashes of Lightning. But one must be careful with some of Egan's translations. His 1822 edition of Grove gives Corinthian, as in Corinthian Tom, as the highest order of swells. Well, I dutifully noted that down in, in the notes, but I started to wonder whether it was right when reading Robert Morrison's excellent book, Regency Revolution, which says Corinthian is a chic Regency designation that revealingly implies that Tom is both elegant and lewd. Egan's dictionary differs, in fact, from his two forebears. Groves and Clark both have a Corinthian as a frequenter of brothels, also an impudent, brazen-faced fellow. Looking at the Cruikshank's illustrations, one wonders if some of that seediness remains, and the impudence might also be important. Corinthian Tom, after all, is no aristocrat. His father was in trade. Egan employs a trick that many novelists have subsequently used. The, ingen the, the ingenue is, like the reader, brought into a defined social setting 
and must be gradually taught the language of that realm. Well, it happens in Oliver Twist. Oliver is taught how things work by being taught how to speak in the London underworld. And it happens in Clueless, the 1990s adaptation of Jane Austen's Emma, in which the outsider, Ty, is instructed in how to behave in a Beverly Hills school. When she asks what words like a Monet or a Betty mean when applied to other girls, the viewer too learns the code and feels the warm pleasure of being part of the in crowd. Life in London does this, but it does it, does it in an accelerated way that becomes bewildering rather than reassuring. Rather than learning the language of a single social realm, the characters learn that of a huge range of boxers, coach drivers, thieves, dustmen, artists, aristocrats. Tom, Jerry and Logic use them all. Greg Dark points out that Egan casually conflates the words slang and cant. These were two different things. Slang was used by a range of classes, while cant was a code used by criminals to avoid detection. Egan is a fundamentally casual writer. He's indifferent about just about anything. But the effect is important. The language one reads in Life in London is not the language of a particular group. Although Egan did not invent new words, it's accurate when the Sheffield Independent said in 1828 that Egan invented a language because no one group spoke like that. It becomes a generalized slang of Londoners, a kind of theatrical patter adopted by those who are careering around the metropolis. Egan's slang is not a marker of authenticity, a, con a connection with a particular group located socially or geographically. Quite the contrary, it's a marker of a willingness to adopt the guises presented by a, a diverse city, as if London were one linguistic dressing up box and the streets were a masquerade ball. The point comes home when the characters are at the royal cockpit. Bob Logic is the guide to the slang of the mixed crowd, but at one point he's thrown when Jerry says, Lethe. I'm not up to that. I'm not up to that phrase. It is new, I suppose, and you want to quiz me, replies Bob. Well, it's the word that Tom and Jerry had been using as a code whenever they risked, risked exposing themselves when they were in the high society setting of a ball at Almax. Bob's moment of doubt is characteristic of the whole book. All of these words are new and no one uses them with total authenticity. Simply by italicizing new, that word starts to hover dubiously. We wonder if new is also a kind of slang. Egan prompted into life two rival parallel genres of novel that both gained huge popularity in the 1820s and 30s, the Silver Fork novel and the Newgate novel. Both depend on inducting the reader into a closed off social world. The Silver Fork novel brings middle class readers behind the scenes of aristocratic life. It takes its name from teaching reader, readers the importance of knowing which fork to use when eating fish. The Newgate novel does the same with the London criminal underworld. But this division of high and low is much too neat for Egan. We cannot read life in London's use of language as the upper class is appropriating the slang of the lower classes as they slum it, because their characters and their language belong in no one location. The other reason that Egan's book needs an editor is the sheer number and range of references that he makes to people and places, and the number of unattributed quotations. Well, we've spent a lot of time looking these up and writing the notes, but like the slang, I wonder whether our notes for our edition restore to us an original reading experience that give us the reference points that anyone would have had in 1820, or whether a certain amount of bewilderment was always part of the point of life in London. In the quotation on the slide here, he casually mentions Signor Antonelli. This is a reference that's eluded me so far, though I have found a, a Monsieur Ivan Ivanitz Chabert, the only really incombustible man, who appears in the newspapers of this era 
dancing on red hot iron bars. I don't have time to discuss Egan's Don Giovanni reference, but even this is more complex than you might imagine. It points both to Mozart's opera and to W.T. Moncrief's uh, rather trashier play. This rush of names and places creates a fascinating picture of the social scene in 1820. For example, Cranbourne Alley is not just a street, but a street with milliners' shops on it and associated with parvenu pretensions to gentility. So the name becomes a kind of code. Most scholars of this period will know Canning, Brougham, Geoffrey, Hazlitt. Not so many will know Jacko Macaco, the fighting monkey, Maria Theresa Bland, the singer, Andrew Whiston, the disabled Dundonian beggar, or André Jean-Jacques Desé, the ballet dancer, teacher, and choreographer. Egan drops these name in, names in as if they're all the same. I suspect he knows that they aren't and that there's some difference between Hazlitt and Whiston. Something similar happens with his unattributed quotations. J.C. Reid is right to say that Egan does not know much of the great romantic poets, but it tips the balance too much the other way when Reid says that he makes up for this in, quote, his encyclopedic knowledge of popular writing and sub-literature of street songs, ballads, broadsides, thieves' chronicles. He knew these texts, but editing life in London leads me to say that the truly popular street literature is not Egan's real home. His home was rather much more familiar to Charles Lamb, the print culture that produced the magazines, the visual satire and the theatre. There are in, an enormous number of references to farces and comedies by the likes of George Coleman and Richard Brinsley Sheridan. These were playing constantly on the London and provincial stages in the Regency. Here we have the account of Tom's love for his paramour, Corinthian Kate. Sure, such a pair were never seen. Well, that line from Sheridan's Joanna was extremely well known, but it had also become proverbial. From 1818, on the left of the slide, we have George Cruikshank's social satire, and on the right, we have Hone's Queen Caroline's satire, both of which make reference to the same line. Similarly, many of the popular songs that Egan quotes are, are best known, not so much as broadside ballads, but as songs that became part of the repertoire of the comedians that Charles Lamb celebrates in the old actors. He quotes at one point the popular ballad, The Beggar's Imitations. Well, I found cheap broadsides of this, songs, of this song, but I also know that it was a speciality of the actor James Robertson who performed it at theatres in London, Bath and elsewhere. Other songs that Egan quotes are famous for being performed by Lamb's favourite mug cutter, the comic acting genius, Joseph Munden. So what initially looks like a marker of Egan's low authenticity may be just that. He quotes a song that really is known to the labouring poor, printed as a penny broadside. But I suspect that he and his audience knew it best from the theatre, a venue that was so important to Egan, not for giving access to one social class, but for giving access to them all. A revealing example is a, re a reference that initially threw me off the scent to borrow the hunting slang beloved of Jerry Hawthorne. At a masquerade ball, the trio hear the strains at one point of a favourite air from Guy Mannering. Well, Scott's novel of that name of 1815 was an enormous popular success. I couldn't remember the song though, so I dutifully ploughed through the novel looking for it. To no avail, Oh Slumber, My Darling, is from Daniel Terry's 1816 theatrical adaptation of Scott's novel. As Annika Bouts explores in an excellent recent article, this adaptation is an important part of Regency theatrical history. Far, far more people saw Terry's adaptation than read Scott's novel. It, pl it played all over Britain and Ireland and beyond for many years. In fact, this is the version that Keats knew when he, and, and the one that he was referring to on his Scots tour, he, he hadn't read the novel, 
The play opened at Covent Garden, which newly expanded to hold 3,000 people, was increasingly vying with the illegitimate theatres for the same mixed audience. Terry's play, Bouts argues, is a delicate balance between the desire to attract a large audience and the desire to remain respectable for the middle classes. That rather awkward balance is nicely drawn out by Egan. The song that they hear at the ball is a parody. So rather than Terry's, oh slumber my darling, thy sire is a knight, thy mother a lady so lovely and bright. We have a song about a young criminal. It's on the left hand side of the slide. Oh slumber my kitty, thy dad is a scamp, thy mother's a bunter, brushed off on the tramp. What seems an impish inversion of cultural categories is not quite bad. Parody is always a mirror. To get the joke, we need to be in on both sides of the reference to know both Walter Scott and the underworld. Both kinds of song would have been equally acceptable at the theatres where Guy Mannering played and where Life in London adaptations, the Tom and Jerry plays, would play in the next few years. Egan clinches the point by having the song, the song sung at a masquerade ball, a location in which identity is a game. It's sung, it, the song is sung not by a real thief, or at least we suppose it's not by a real thief, but by an unknown woman who is dressed, as Egan rather coyly says, a la poissante. J.C. Reed says that life in London was to make Egan as well known an author on the vulgar level as Scott was on the polite one. But in fact, both Egan and Walter Scott reached a very similar audience and both reached the vulgar or plebeian culture through the efforts of their adapters for theatre and print culture. The result is that life in London hovers between social, political and cultural categories. So to finish up then, Egan gives us a constant cascade of reference points, a cascade that does not clearly differentiate between cultural or social categories. It's a variety that makes the novel unusually hard to place or even to read. Editors, I've started to realise, read more intensely than others. I've also realised that editors might not always read so well as others. Perhaps an editor misses the point of the book on which they lavish attention Exactly by that lavish attention, editors become mired in a pile of tiny details while a reader sees the narrative arc. Well, my favourite bit of life in London is the dustman story that is overheard in a gin shop on the way home from seeing Jacko Macaco fight. There's lots of things I like about it, but one reason I think that it sticks in my head is that it's so full of slang and obscure references that, that it took me absolutely ages to annotate. It's another bit that challenges any reading of the novel as coherent. Tom and Jerry fade from view as the dustman's story takes on an energy that exceeds any underlying principle one might look for. And yet this feeling that life in London is a series of detachable bits rather than a consolidated whole is not my misreading, this simply is the novel. It's a problem that critics and indeed novelists try to solve when placing Egan in a pattern. Many historians use Egan's novel as an example of a vanished world. Ben Wilson in Decency and Disorder, an excellent book, sees it as the last gap of Regency licentiousness that became impossible by 1837. Charles Lamb, of course, was complaining about that in the 1820s, such as when he wrote to, uh, to Barry Cornwall about this damn canting, unmasculine, unbody age. Thackeray and Dickens have the same impression that things have changed, but theirs is not always a wistful backward glance, as Nicholas Nickleby's Sir Mulberry, Hawk, Sir Mulberry Hawk's pursuit of Kate Nickleby, um, a character so unlike Corinthian Kate, indicates. Such views seek to place Egan in a historical moment, which seems right and yet too confident. It is striking that this reaction to Egan, that he represented a vanished age, seemed to occur almost immediately. His was already a depiction of a culture that no one could quite point to. Egan's London is palpably real, and yet a kind of fantasy 
Watching Jackal Macaco, the fighting monkey, Tom notes the overpowering smell caused by the crowd and the blood. It's a rare author who notices smell. It's a mark of Egan's vivid realism. Tom's little joke is to ask Jerry if he did not like perfumery, as the pit was as highly scented as Gatti's. Well, Gatti's, I can explain. Gatti and Pierce was a fashionable chemist that sold perfume. It was on New Bond Street. It was a startlingly camp way of being realistic and indicates that Egan's realism cleaves to the reality of a culture of contradiction, juxtaposition, of masquerade. Editing Egan throws up a huge range of names and on words. Like I said, I still don't know who Signor Antonelli is, but I'd know Caleb Baldwin and George Barrington if I met them in Gatties and Pierce's. And I could tell you what a Bow Wow shop is, even if I lost my barnacles while being a bit bosky over burnt wine in the back slums. Well, the addition, I hope, will help readers find their way around Egan's London. But even with the notes that we'll provide in the book, on top of the notes that Egan provides, a certain amount of bewilderment will probably remain. I think that's appropriate. Egan was such a success at the end of the Regency, not because he gave his readers reality in the way we think of it in late, later in the 19th century, the reality found in a Zola novel. It was rather the reality of a Regency world that mirrored Egan's novel in being so overproductive that it was impossible to draw it into a coherent pattern. Thanks very much. Thank you, David. Um, that was absolutely marvellous talk. Um, it was great, such a compelling um, peep into the stews um, from the street songs, um, comic actors, uh, the only incombustible man. I love the sound of Signor Antonelli, um, fire, what, fire eater and hornpipe dancer, um, talented gentleman. Um, so we had a real insight into um, the parts of romantic London we're only just really beginning fully to explore, I think. Um, it's going to be a landmark edition. We're really excited and, and grateful that you gave us this first glimpse of it. Um, I would like to open it up to questions, please. Um, and if people have a question, if they could just note it in the chat, please, um, or raise your hand and we'll come to you. Um, so we've got um, a little bit of time now um, that David's agreed to, um, to, to discuss the edition. Um, so lots, I don't know whether you can see the chat, um, David, but uh, there's lots of positive responses there. Um, Jane, can I call on you to ask our first question? Hi, Felicity. Hi, David. Thanks. I absolutely loved your talk and um, have such a long and rambling question in kind of Egan-esque fashion. So I'm going to try and make it shorter. Um, and um, I heard everything you were saying about this being a book that hovers between political, social and cultural categories, a book that seems to produce simultaneously the immersive reader and the interrogative reader. Um, um, and a book that produces at its end a certain or leaves behind a certain um, residue of bewilderment, or maybe not even a residue, but a product. Maybe that bewilderment is, is a product. So my question is, do you, do you see anything in the, in the way of some kind of transvaluation of categories as a mode of strategy of resistance to something? I'm, I'm not sure what. Um, at work in, in Egan's style. And, and does that map on to um, a kind of um, um, national politics? I mean, I know that you, of course, um, Egan is, is tied into a Cockney culture, which um, explicitly uh, indicates uh, an English national context. Of course, he himself was not English. So yes, that's my question. Is there, is there a strategy at work? Um, and does that strategy map on to um, a national politics? Does that, does that make sense as a question? Yes, absolutely. Thanks very much, Shane. Um, yeah, well, hmm. I suppose my, my reading of it, uh, like, like some Buddha sends and, and like Greg Darts, is to not emphasize strategy here. Um, and I think it's, it's hard reading Egan to feel that he has 
he has a vision. And, and yet, simply by, by piling on so much stuff, by giving us such a, a, a range, that, that creates a kind of aesthetic mode, one that seems, um, but one that seems pointedly not like other things in, in, in the culture of the era. Um, I guess the issue might be whether he was really particularly thinking of those, those other cultural things. I mean, it, it's completely unlike Wordsworth's prelude when he writes about London. But of course, Egan wouldn't have known that. It's impossible for him to have done so. I think what it does is it tends to mirror other things. And, and in fact, it's the strategy, such as it is, is, is about a celebration of what the other forms of culture he sees in his own, his own era. And that, in, that includes 18th century forms, a picaresque novel, which he, which he gratefully acknowledges, in particular Stern, who is his great hero, along with, with Sheridan, um, but also magazines and the um, kind of popular print culture and, and the theatre and so on. So it's, I, I feel that there's a, there's a, there's a sort of declaration of, of affection for, for a culture there, which I think is hard to fix in social terms. And I think Greg Dart's absolutely right about that. It's not to, to place this as low culture and, and a kind of impish um, rejection of high culture doesn't seem right. So the other question about nationality, I think, is very interesting. And um, as you perhaps, perhaps know this, very good article about this by uh, by John John Strachan um, called Pierce Egan West Britain, um, which which does which I think does tra track out the the elements of Egan which he, he does seem to sort of honour his his Irish roots and and John makes a, a good point I think that 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 fascination with Stern is 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 partly partly that I think it's partly a way of finding an affinity. Um, Egan though was a was somebody who seemed to not be particularly bothered about being Irish. You know, he, he spent very little time there, although he did write a play that was enormously successful called Life in Dublin, which, which took him back there. He seems to be able to balance being British and Irish, which isn't a balance anyone has anymore, but it was a balance that was available in, in, in the time. Um, people know this as well, but his boxing writing, he does tend to overemphasize or even claim right, uh, boxers who who aren't really Irish, he claimed them as Irish or to, to emphasize their Irishness at that point. So there's, it seems to me a rather casual relationship with Ireland. One that, that, that doesn't seem to develop um, into, into much of a thought, but perhaps others who know more about the, um, the, you know, the large Irish communities in the particular areas like St. Giles in the era might, might be able to correct me, but it does seem, it's, there's something there, but not not particularly strong. Thanks, David. It's fascinating. Thank you. I think Sam has a question in the chat. Sam, do you Sorry. want to? I can. I can un. <laughs> I can unmute and um, and say my question. Um, so uh, I so enjoyed that, David. It was great. Um, so this is a book that I've I've always felt embarrassed for not knowing better. So I'm sorry if I'm kind of misunderstanding in the reading. I, I suppose it, it just feels like the culture of the book is the masculine homosexuality is, is so strong, um, but clearly the popularity of the book um extended kind of um across the sort of uh, the, the mix of, of genders as well as classes there is a little bit more that you can say about how far it was perceived as being a sort of a blokish book in the time and and how far it it it, it kind of throws up interest about sort of tensions in in gender and in the culture of the 20s thank you that's a really good point i'd never thought about that but of course, that's such a striking thing that, that it does. Those are that the fan in particular seems not only feminine but also middle class in its associations. Although I'm no fan expert, but yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, I, clearly Egan was reaching female, a female audience, particularly through the theatre. Um, he has female characters in it who are, are kind of woefully underwritten. All of his characters are, are superficial, but the, the female characters have really no particularly important part to play. Um, as, as others have pointed out, John Gardner and Richard Cronin, that the real, the real partnership of Tom 
is with Jerry, and the importance of Corinthian Kate is purely another marker of Tom's masculinity. It feels it feels hard to imagine a, a female audience finding much particular interest in this. And certainly when he describes the, the social world that they go into in terms of the Daffy Club and these kind of boxing circles, we know that there were women there and that there were there were women as part of those crowds, but the drinking clubs are they're they're, they're male worlds, and that, that's very much their point, I think. Um, I don't know of any, there's, there's, there's no discussion of this in terms of the reception. No, no one really brings up whether only men or only women are reading it, whether it has a particularly male appeal. But I would say though, it, it does seem to me typical of the, of the culture's rather uneasy relationship with masculinity as, as, as explored by lots of people, um, particularly in, in Paper Pellets by, by Richard Cronin. And that, that's pointing, I think, to a feeling that a lot of this masculinity is a certain amount of fancy dress, uh, an, an attempt to assert a masculine culture that, that's necessary because it feels unsure of itself. And so it feels, in that sense, I think quite appropriate that there are Tom, Tom and Jerry carousing around town is printed on a shawl or a fan. So. That's great, thank you. Um, do we have any other questions? I guess I would like to, I'd like to ask a question that does betray ignorance of, um, of, of this book, but I'm waiting, I'm waiting for the ideal edition to come along. Um, I want to know a bit more about the question of empathy that you brought up and the spectator, there's a role of the spectator, you cited um, Simon Hall talking about the city of theatre hedonism of, of Egan and the, and you were talking about the role of the amused spectator that the reader's also involved in. How does that differ from Lamb as as sort of empathetic or as a spectator in the city. It was making me think differently about some of his portrayals of, of beggars, of street scenes, which have always struck me as having a curiously unempathic aspect to them. Well, I think Simon Howell's point is that Lamb, Lamb really is being empathetic here, but he does so through a very unusual route. And it's an empathy that he develops through his, his irony. Um, mm -hmm. So that we, we, we see things like the, um, the discussions of the chimney sweeps or the, or the beggars as, um, like on the decay of beggars in the metropolis, as we see them as objects for his, um, well, I suppose not even his sympathy, but, but for his entertainment. And yet he kind of he kind of turns that inwards and, and asks us to reimagine re the relationship, so that spectacle becomes a way of of connecting with the person that's that's on show and, and enjoying that show, and that's Simon Hall's take, not not mine. But I do find that find that right that that there's a kind of generosity to Lamb that emerges kind of beneath the text. And thinking about the those great descriptions of all the chimney sweeps eating sausages um, and uh, it's, it's it's so loving I think in a way mm. and I think there are times when it's very hard to feel that Egan has quite that level of of interest and I think part of the reason is that he just dashes on whereas that, that essay of Lambs mm. it really dwells on it and it you know there's one who I think he burned his fingers on the sausages and starts licking them you know you you, you imagine it and he's bringing you into their world and in a way that I think Egan tends not to do. I mean, I think there are moments in Egan where he does just kind of give a character some space and, and gives a, a moment some space. The, the Dustman is an example of that, where they just tell a really funny story that just goes on and on and on. It has no relevance to anything Tom and Jerry do, but it was clearly something that, that Egan found interesting. Mm. I, I, I think Hull's, Simon Hall's right. I think there is a difference between Egan and Lamb in, in exactly that. Em, em, empathetic quality to the to the work. That's really interesting. 
Um, and, um, and I look forward to putting them alongside one another again and thinking about the potential differences. And, um, great, thank you, David. Um, so I think there are a couple of questions to come. John Strachan in the chat. John, do you want to ask your question? Yes, um, I thought that was a riveting paper, David. I'm re really looking forward to the to the publication. Um, perhaps you could. Uh, I wonder when it might be out. I mean, that, that's going to take a long time, isn't it? And the level of annotation seems extraordinary. But I just, I just invite you to talk about um, Egan's supposed vulgarity, because when John Wilson's trying to be nice to him in backwards, he say he's, that phrase they occasionally use. He's a Londoner, but no Cockney. But Thomas Hood, and after that, and Dick, uh, Dickens are kind of concerned and somewhat pained by <laughs> comparisons between themselves and, and, and Egan. And Hood is sniffy about Pickwick, saying it's kind of life in London-esque. And Dickens is very touchy in kind of middle age about being compared to Egan. So I, I guess your thoughts on <laughs> the supposed vulgarity of P.S. Egan, please. Yeah, I, I think a lot of the vulgarity actually comes about through the adaptations. And, and the, um, the, ad the accusation that Egan is incredibly bawdy seems not, not really accurate either. He's usually quite careful, and that's true of the, the dictionary he produces as well, which is full of little evasions which aren't there in, in the, earlier, um, the earlier text. So I think it's, it's something that emerges. And I, I, I would suspect, I think with... It's hard really to draw a line between Egan and other writers of that era um, in, in class terms and in terms of cultural, cultural position. That he's actually much closer to them than, than they might like. And I suspect that's part of the part of the itchiness in, in Hoods and, and Dickens. Um, I don't think Walter Scott ever commented on it, but that my suggestion that Egan and Scott is, are rather similar isn't one I think Scott would have particularly liked either. And and yet there is actually, they're, they're, not, they're not so far apart and they are reaching a, a similar audience. Um, he does, there's, yeah, there's, there's a kind of a willingness to use, to be frank about sexual matters that, that isn't there in, in the other writers. And um, which I think becomes, a, 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 that's part of Dickens and Thackeray's feeling that this is a past age, we can't, we can't really do that anymore. But he's at the same point, he's far less frank than many of the others in, in his own culture. So I think there's something in that maybe. Thanks. Um, right, let's move on to, uh, I think Dave, David, you have a question. Hi, yeah, thank you. That was a, that was a fascinating um, talk. And yeah, like everyone else here, I can't wait for the um, for the uh, finished edition. Um, I was really interested by what you were saying about Egan's background being um, being kind of immersed in that print culture and actually being a compositor himself. And then what you said about the, the book edition moving around um, episodes from, from the original serial edition. I just wondered if that typographic kind of um a sort of versatility i suppose of the edition whether that's something that that changes between the the serial edition and, and the print edition also i like what you're saying about the kind of the reader somehow f the experience of the reader paralleling that of the characters and whether we have some sort of playing around with ideas of impression and the city kind of imprinting itself on our uh, on our minds as we read, which in some ways is kind of reinforced by that typographical, um, the typographical spree, I suppose he, he goes on. That's a nice question. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think it's really important that he's a compositor and it's important that he knew, he knew the trade. He's really fascinated by work and always comments on work. And um, when his footnotes are full of these really intense descriptions of, of how things get made. Uh, and I do think that's that's part of the book. Um, well, we haven't been able to see the original serial editions because we only just found that they were that they, they existed. No one even knew that they existed until very very recently, and they're they're in the US. So we haven't had a chance to look at them yet. Um, based on the front covers, which I have seen, the the typography is the same, and I think it's just replicating the the numbers are are just being reused in the, in the printed edition, which I think would be common um 
But of course, I suppose the other side of that is uh, in relation to the other part of your question is that experience of a city that is full of print and, and walking around uh, streets that are covered in, in, uh, in posters and sort of thing that comes out in Thomas Hood's pictures of, of the city is that feeling of, of a city that's full of, full of printed material, which I think is then, yeah, nicely being mirrored in, in the text itself, which is city-like in its capacity to bewilder us with all these sort of flashing signs, as it were. Yeah, thank you. And I think we've got uh, Simon next. Oh, sorry, I'm pressing too many buttons. Thank you, uh, Felicity. Cheers, David. That was fascinating. Um, I just wondered if you could talk a little bit more about uh, the relationship, maybe between the form and the overall, if there is an overall politics to the book, or whether you felt that it was more, much more variegated than that. I think there was a question maybe from Jane that kind of pushed towards asking what is the political direction of this book? And I, I, it's still a question I've, I've you know, I, I've still not settled on this at all because it seems to pull in so many different directions. But I just wonder what you thought. Well, I think it is a question of form and content there, isn't it? Because that's, there are, there are moments where he becomes, you know, he just kind of gives us a sort of Toryism, if you like, where these um, beggars are people to be looked at and yet mistrusted, and yet they're, well, your, your favourite bit of the book, Simon, is that big footnote about pawnbrokers, and it's so good because he's so angry about it, and he, he really does, there's a real rage there. And one thing I suppose I've just noted is just looking through my own annotations, how often when I found out who, who somebody was, that somebody was in the same time that Egan was writing the book, involved on the Queen's side in the Queen Caroline affair. And so that could almost become, feel like a sort of cold. And, and yeah, thinking back to Jane's question, there seems, there seems something challenging in the very nature of a book like Life in London. And yet, I suppose it's, I just think it's impossible to make a coherent politics out of the book. And it feels, from everything I've read about Egan and everything else he's written, there's, there's no moment in which he announces a manifesto or aligns himself with any, any political feeling or at all. And that the form of the text, I think, doesn't help because it tends to indicate a, a writer who's, who's just not interested in developing a position in that respect. Although he will give us moments in which you can only feel anger about the prison or, or whatever it is that he's describing. It's just contradictory as well. I suppose that's another problem that we've got. He's a writer as well that can write in many different modes almost at the same time, and he almost requires you to read like that, especially in the, I mean, most directly in the relationship between the footnotes and the, and the main body of the text, which seem to be pulling in very, very different sort of social directions in terms of, you know, awareness. And but yeah, brilliant paper. Thanks, David. It's fantastic. Right. Thank you. I think we've got one final question from Rick, please. That was absolutely terrific, David. Um, thank you very much. Um, I was particularly interested in the exploration of the, um, the role play of, of a figure who's called Corinthian, but as you pointed out, um, the term has connotations quite other than sort of pure aristocracy. Mm. Um, but whether it's whether he's a kind of fake aristocrat or a real one, there's something that I've always assumed was sort of essentially regency about the fact that they're just playing a game. Uh, that it's just uh, the, the term spree, particularly suggesting this, but countless examples of where it's, they, they talk about the fact that it's, it's a game. Um, but the fact that they pretend to be, um, particularly when they go into the lower reaches to be uh, upper class figures, it's interesting to me what, how, you, how broad based the appeal of the book was, and I suppose especially through the theatrical adaptations 
as well, which um, it, because it's so different, the, the tone in which they explore the lower reaches from what you get um, 30 years later in the Victorian period, there's, there's a sense in which you assume that this is something that's, um, that's had its day once this phase is passed. And yet if you just have to think about the way in which this is a, a sort of perennial feature of at least British society. Um, if, for example, the prime minister on an election campaign can go to the northeast of England and persuade um, steel workers and fishermen that he is one of us, that somehow that the there is a um, there's a sense in which uh, the Tom and Jerry entering into lower class haunts straight away, despite disguise, persuade people that they uh, just have the common touch. They are immediately trusted. Um, I mean, it's, I'm, it's a long winded question. I'm getting around to saying, do you, do you think that there is something essentially Regency about the the, the the class appeal of the book, or do you think that it, it does in fact um, have, that it's more perennial? That's a great question, thanks. And, and a really good example as well. Um, and yeah, something I was kind of thinking to myself as I was writing this actually was what like what to do with what Dickens does with it and, and that feeling like an end point. And I didn't feel that was right. But yeah, that's a, yeah, what you say I think is spot on because yeah, they're able to enter into this world and be accepted, but they're accepted precisely because Tom retains something of the gentleman about himself, even as disguised as a beggar. And, and the implication seems to be that the, the beggars have this kind of fun, like inbuilt respect for their betters, especially when they're playing games that, have, that, that indicate a common, uh, common masculinity or a common Britishness or something like that. Um, unlike many of his peers, he doesn't make much use of those kinds of concepts like Britishness, and yet there's there's some suggestion of that, and and perhaps that perhaps that's never really gone away, as as you say, reminding you, I live in the northeast of England, so um, I, I know I know what you're talking about as far as that goes. So perhaps that yeah, that capacity to to, to feel that class is a game is something that's been yeah, been used and reused. And Gregory Dart makes that point as well when he says there's there's something that for all the talk about class, we tend to forget there's the element of fantasy inherent in it that allows people to play up class yeah. ideas. And, and perhaps that's that is the perennial point that, that you make. So it's a very rambly answer, but the point is that I think I think you're right. I think there is something that's not just Regency about this. It was less rambling than my question, and it was actually very helpful. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank Thanks. There are some great comments in the uh, and questions coming out in the chat. Actually, let's just have a a quick look. Um, so, Eric. Um, Eric, do you want to, do you actually want to um, come in with this point? Such a good, uh, it is a great question. Does Egan have any impact on yeah. later non-fictional London chroniclers of working class life? Well, I'm not aware that there's any direct connection, but I suspect I mean, it's that thing where something is so phenomenally successful that people would simply know it. And it continued to be successful on the stage and indeed in printed editions into the 19th century. So at the time for me, you... mm. so maybe, I think that's, that's not a very great, not a great answer, but, but I think it was, certainly would have been available as, as a model, although it seems to me that the, um, the attitude is, is quite different. Mm, but it's becoming embedded in the culture as something to push against mm -hmm. as much as anything. Yeah. And yeah. David has a great point. 
yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's a random thought, really, uh, more than a, a question. So uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be addressed. But um, uh, yeah, I always think Corinthian always makes me think of Burke's point about the nobility, which uh, I know you're saying it's not a very kind of that they're not real kind of noble people, but there's a sort of aspiration somehow to to float above, to be part of, but also aloof from the um, the kind of varied society. Yeah, indeed. And but also to look like decoration, I think, as well. And I think that might be the sort of two elements of that, an aspiration to be the um the core of society as as aristocrats, which which of course Tom isn't. Um but also to be the kind of decoration you might find in a Regency street as designed by by Nash. So a question about which which edition to get before ours comes out. Well, well we're supposed to finish it in September of next year. I'm totally confident we're going to hit that deadline because we've done most of the work. Um, so it should be should be out in um, 2023. I suppose that is quite a long time away. And in between times, yeah, the, the John Camden Houghton um, edition from the 1860s is a really good one because it's got the plates with it. You can also get this if, if you don't mind reading online through Google Books. So there is a, is a perfectly good reprint of this on, on Google Books. Which you can find easily, and it's a good re readable edition. Although I would say, what you what, what it really needs is some good footnotes by um, a team of editors and, and an excellent production <laughs> to make it come together. But in the meantime, <laughs> that's that's where you can get it. Thanks very much. Right. Um, thank you, David. Um, and um, as people are saying in the chat, it was fascinating. And I'm going to hand over now uh, to John to do the formal thanks. Thank you very much, Felicity. And what a paper that was. I mean, Rick's question reminded me, there's an article by Thackeray in the Quarterly Review in 1855, and he portrays a little boy talking to his grandparents and said, well, uh, Grandpapa, how many watchmen did you kill in the Regency? And <laughs> <laughs> and Grandmama, did you really wear a dress as skimpy as that in, in 1850? There wasn't very much of it, was there? So there's a kind of, maybe Egan was a bit of a, a kind of uh, an ancient voice by the 1850s. Thackeray was like Dickens was rather jaundiced about Egan as well. Well, can we, uh, we'll say for thank you formally to David for that. Uh, it's astoundingly good paper in a minute. But before we wind proceedings up, can I give you a reminder of the next meeting of the Charles Lamb Society, which is in 2022, so early next year, again virtually, when the aforesaid Dr. Mary Shannon of Roehampton University will be talking to us about Billy Waters and 19th century popular culture, which I think will really complement today's talk. So that is on the 22nd of January, 2022 at 2pm. Uh, by then you will have seen an excellent new edition of the Charles Lamb Bulletin edited by John Gardner, which is currently at the press. Uh, it contains details of our new Lamb Society essay prize. So uh, what, watch this space. If you haven't renewed your membership for next year, please do so. If you're not a member of the Charles Lamb Society, please do join us. So thank you very much, a wonderful turnout, wonderful questions. Thank you so much for reading, Ben. And in particular, let us thank uh, David once again for a remarkably good, insightful, amusing, and, and critically brilliant paper. Thank you very much, David. I will just put the uh, joining details in the chat for anybody who's let their subscription lapse. Um, it's, uh, it, it's perfectly possible to pay, do, do it by PayPal now and, uh, and, and support great talks like this. Thank you, David. Thank you very much. <laughs>